It's a common theme in the Bible. Exile. And that's exactly where Jacob finds himself in the story that we're going to discuss today. He's in exile in Padan Aram, which is the country in which Laban lives, his uncle, the brother of his sister. And today I want to talk to you about three concepts that come up in the text of Genesis 30, going over a bit into the beginning of chapter 31. The first thing is the concept of a shepherd. We've come across it a couple of times already in Genesis. The first shepherd that we encountered was Abel, who's the younger brother of Cain, and he gets killed. Jesus calls him the first prophet. In this case, we've got another shepherd. He's one of the patriarchs, the last of the three great patriarchs before Joseph comes onto the scene and then the 12 tribes of Israel take over. Jacob is currently a shepherd. And the common thing that one sees when regarding shepherds in the Old Testament, but I think it's a common thing generally speaking, is that the shepherd is not looking after his own sheep, but instead he's looking after sheep, uh, the sheep of a farmer. And so you've got a structure that's always in place when you're looking at shepherds, in which there's a worldly authority that's put above the one who takes care of the property of this worldly authority. In this case, it's Laban. And Laban, as we see in the story, is not necessarily the most fair worldly authority. And that's the second kind of complex that I want to look at, which is that of Laban, in this case, the worldly authority. Let's put above Jacob, the shepherd. And finally, we want to also still look at the family of Jacob, who are Rachel and Leah and their kids. By this time, Rachel has born her first son, her first own son, who is called Joseph, the one who multiplies or increases. Joseph's still going to play a really important role, but currently he's just a baby. And as soon as he's born, Jacob goes over to Laban and says, look, I want to go back to the country of my fathers, to Canaan, the promised land. And so I want to take my things and I want to leave. But Laban tells him, no, please, stay a bit longer. Um, I've done some divination, and what's really interesting is that where the word divination is used here, the same word in the Hebrew appears as serpent in Genesis 3. So that divination that Laban is doing and the serpent that appears in Genesis 3 are literally the same entity. And one can kind of <laughs> speculate and think, well, maybe Laban is engaging in some sort of strange satanic activities. Uh, the word in Hebrew is nahash. And after Laban has done this divination, he's found out that the only reason that he's been blessed in the past couple of years while Jacob has been working for him is because of Jacob, because the Lord is with Jacob. And he bears the blessing that uh, Isaac gave to him. So because of you, many nations will be blessed as a part of the blessing that was given to Abraham that's been passed down through the generations. And now this blessing is with Jacob instead of Esau, as we saw in the previous stories. So Laban, as the one who owns the cattle and the land in which Jacob is doing his work, makes an offer to Jacob. One might say an offer he cannot refuse. <laughs> and so Jacob says, okay, I'll accept your offer to stay. Laban offers him a reward, name it, and I'll give it to you. And in the word name, in this verse, uh, appears the root that lies at the heart of the word female as well, which is quite interesting. So name your reward uh, is very close to a female in the language of, of the Bible. And that's also interesting because of what Leah and Rachel then say closer to the end of this complex that I'm, that I'm working through. But we'll still get there. The price that Jacob names is that he wants to have all of the goats and the sheep and the cows that are spotted or speckled or striped in the herd of Laban. And Laban agrees. He's like, okay, uh, we'll put a three days road between you and me, and you can take the cattle and look after them like a shepherd should, graze them out in the wilderness and lead them to the water as a shepherd does, Psalm 23. And that's what Jacob does. But he also uses some sticks. So I think at first, the text here is a bit difficult to understand, but I think at first we get like an outsider's perspective. Jacob is doing strange things. It looks almost like magic, which is not unfamiliar to these people in this time. 
magic was quite rampant. That's one of the things that Laban practices according to his own testimony. And Jacob is throwing sticks that he's skimmed into water that the herds then drink. And then based on these sticks, for some reason, the herds, when they reproduce, only produce speckled animals so that the amount of speckled animals increases. And then Jacob also does some very clever kind of crafty selection. <laughs> and he makes sure that only the speckled animals, so that the strongest of the speckled animals breed so that there's only strong speckled animals. So basically he's kind of trying to design the herd in such a way that he gets not only the most amount of animals out of it, but that he also gets really strong animals, <laughs> really healthy animals out of the whole spiel. And so his reward increases greatly. Eventually, the sons of Laban notice this and they're like, they begin, uh, begin murmuring amongst themselves and, and they say, well, Jacob's taking all of the wealth that our father has uh, for himself. So they get a bit dissatisfied and grumble and Jacob notices this and he uh, takes a look at Laban and he sees Laban is also not looking at him as favorably as he did three days ago. And then he goes to his wives and he speaks to them and he says, look, your dad is no longer a big fan of mine. I think we should uh, get out of here. <laughs> so he gathers them together and they say, you know what? He sold us to you um, and he's been cheating you this whole time. Whatever you've made in your labor for him, despite the fact that he's been constantly sort of changing the wages that he set for you so that he gets the most out of it. And despite the fact that that hasn't worked out well for him, Everything that you get from him basically belongs to us because he's also spent the silver that was a part of our bridal price. And so here we've got the third kind of complex of characters, the family of Jacob. So we've got the family of Jacob that's dependent on Jacob. And then Jacob is doing the work for the worldly authority that's been set above him, who is Laban. And Laban is doing kind of dark rituals and he's not tied to heaven in this priestly way in which he should be so that he isn't being fair towards those that are dependent on him. And those in turn cannot provide as they should be able to for those that have been entrusted into their care via some question, questionable <laughs> mechanisms as well, seeing as the, the wedding of Leah and Rachel was also something that Laban twisted in a strange way. So the whole story isn't ideal, and the reason for this is that the one at the top of the food chain, or the hierarchy that's been established in the story, is not doing what he's supposed to be doing. And I think that's important to notice. So Jacob, as a result, the shepherd who's been entrusted with the flocks, the one for whose sake Laban was being blessed, leaves Laban. And because of that, the blessing also leaves Laban. And the great wealth that he accumulated during the time of Jacob's stay there departs. 